Thank you very much. It's a great delight and privilege for me to be here with you today. Um, today's sermon is entitled, Sad Song Say So Much, an exploration of Psalm 88. When I was in college, I used to be a DJ. <laughs> and I found that song lyrics often portray profound bits of wisdom and convey truths about the human existence. The song I want to quote just a bit this morning is a song by Elton John entitled, Sad Songs Say So Much. And it goes like this, just parts of it. If someone else is suffering enough to write it down, when every single word makes sense, then it's easier to have those songs around and suffer just enough to sing the blues. They reach into your room, just feel their gentle touch. When all hope is gone, sad songs say so much. When all hope is gone, why don't you tune in and turn them on? So this morning, we want to tune in and turn on a sad song. And this time, we find it in today's text. Beautiful dynamic reading of the 80th, 88th song in the Psalter. I was telling a friend of mine that I was actually going to be preaching at Wheaton College, and he was duly impressed. And when he asked me what my text was, I told him that it was Psalm 88. His reaction was, but why? As if there are not any more upbeat texts, why do you pick up the, the ultimate depressing psalm? What's the point? And I told him, that's exactly the point. Because it's a depressing psalm, because it's a psalm that's often not uh, read through in liturgical settings in many Protestant churches or global churches throughout. So I said, that's why I want to talk about it. The only other time uh, that I actually preached on this text was in Kenya a few years ago in a rural Pentecostal church. It was a group of about 100 people, and as we read through the text, I could hear from the expressions and the loud amens, especially when the psalm ends by saying, you have taken from me my friend and neighbor, and darkness is my closest friend. If you're into Simon and Garfunkel, that sounds just like the song, hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> Here I come to you again. So here we have a psalm of deep lament and pathos filled of just cry of dereliction without any sense of positive denouement at all. No happy ending. Inasmuch as I like Pharrell Williams and his song, Happy, the psalmist Haman, the Ezraite, will not allow that song to be on his playlist. And I'm so glad that this is an ancient Israel songbook and thus on our playlist, although how often the song gets played in our worship context or our private devotions is not very clear to me at all. So let's take a listen to the author as he describes his sense of fear, loss, nothingness, and morbidity. He says, my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am like a man who has no strength, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more. But here's another pummeling reality. He takes the sovereign freedom and action of God, unencumbered by creaturely intervening seriously, and expresses it this way. Since you are the God who is totally free to be and to act, you have laid me in the lowest pit. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have afflicted me with all your waves. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. As we were living in this, uh, was the second decade of the, the 21st century, I think many of us are becoming much more aware of this kind of talk about inclusion and diversity and globalization. So this morning's chapel message, I would like to focus on the silent minority among us, those who can really identify with Psalm 88. We don't, we don't often hear about Haman the Ezra height, but we know that he probably wrote the most depressing psalm in the book of Psalms. We seldom hear about that. We seldom study that passage. But as we are thinking about the silent minority among us here at Wheaton College, i like the vocal majority to give them and me about 18 more minutes of listening and enter into their world, however provisional that may be. So what is the end result of the sovereign act of Yahweh whose action of creatio ex nihilo has brought everything into being. So this psalmist has a very robust theology of God and God's being and act. Let's listen further to Haman. 
I am shut up. I cannot get out. My eyes waste away because of affliction. It seems to me that this reads like a diary of a manic depressive person whose sense of equilibrium and serenity and sanity is radically altered and disoriented. I have three questions as we run through the remaining 17 minutes together in our sermon. Three questions. One, why don't we hear from Psalm 88 more often? Or what does it tell us about evangelical theology of sadness and suffering? Second question, why are we talking about it, it, this passage two weeks after Easter? Easter happened, as you remember vividly, and so why are we talking about it just merely two weeks after Easter? And thirdly, where is God in all of this? Three questions that will guide our brief reflection upon Scripture together. So why don't we hear about this Psalm 88 more often? Is there perhaps some sort of an inordinate emphasis on the victorious nature of the Christian journey? Could it be that we focus on the fact that Jesus is risen, Jesus is the Pantocrator, that he's the Lord of all cosmos, that we focus on that, and so we don't talk about the other side? We far prefer, in fact, Psalm 42, which although is written by sons of Korah, and it asks, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? It nonetheless ends with a positive note. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise God, my Savior and my friend. So we like this psalm because it ends on a positive note. Surely the sons of Korah are bummed out and depressed and afflicted, yet they turn their gaze unto God in the end and say, I will yet praise my God. Whereas this particular psalm that we are considering this morning, Psalm 88, has none of it. We read that this guy is totally depressed and desolate and morbid. He feels that God, he acknowledges God's existence only to negate God's benevolence by saying, well, I know that God is, and I know that God is powerful, and I know that God is God of Israel. I know that God has given us that relationality, that God desires that we cry out to God, yet when I've done all of it, I find God to be stonewalling me, and God's silence is absolutely deafening for me. In some ways, perhaps we don't really know what to do with a psalm like this, do we? You know, I think the world of Wheaton College, I think, you know, there's, I teach at Vanderbilt University, and Vanderbilt and Wheaton, although they're two somewhat different institutions, one's a Christian school and the other is a secular school, I had a chance to live with the uh, first-year students for about seven years as Vanderbilt started their own residential college system called the Ingram Commons. And I came to realize that as I lived with these students, day in, day out, every day, I was like the glorified RA for seven years. <laughs> and doing that has taught me profoundly about what our kind of college students today go through. I'm a little older than you. I went through college from 1986 to 1990, so it's a long, long time ago. But Vanderbilt students have this kind of perfectionistic kind of desire and kind of standard that is often set before them. As I often wonder about, what are you guys called, the Harvard of Christian College and something like that? I take umbrage at that as a person who didn't go to Harvard, but be that as it may, there doesn't seem much room for frailty and failure. You not only have to be smart, at Vanderbilt certainly, and you have to be sporty and savvy, and I hear that Wheaties are, is that what you're called, Wheaties, right? So I've had, <laughs> Wheaties are supposed to be smart, supposed to be sporty, supposed to be savvy, but also there's one more thing, that you have to be spiritual. And it seems to me to be a kind of a burden that so often you cannot bear alone, right? What if you expect it to be, a, I don't know, starting quarterback, but you're now not even playing football any longer? You came and people said that you're going to be like a great kind of contribution to our conservatory or music program, and you're not in it anymore. You're struggling. Maybe in your high school you were like the smartest kid in math and science, and only to find out that you are ba barely making B minus. When you were younger in high school and middle school, you thought you were so kind of popular and proud of it, profoundly grateful to God for it, but you come to Wheaton and you're just a number in this massive group of students who are smarter than you, savvier than you, sportier than you, and more spiritual than you. So slowly and slowly and slowly, you find yourself on the peripheries and margins. 
people, and, but yet you have to put on a facade. You have to pretend as if everything is going well. You come to chapel and you do all the right things. But deep inside, where are you? Deep inside, you might actually resonate with this Haman the Ezraite. Yes, Lord, I cry out to you, but where are you? Where are you in all of this? So why don't we hear from Psalm 88 more often? Perhaps we like to, in many ways, globally, not just here in Wheaton, Illinois, but there's a desire and pension because the world is watching that we have to appear as if all is well. And as I teach in a secular university, I've come to realize that that kind of messaging isn't really that effective. In some ways, for Christians to be authentically who they are and say, you know, I'm a messed up dude. I don't have it together. Maybe that kind of authenticity, as I've experienced in my own life, has often been the way to actually invite further conversation. Oh, is that where you are? Is that how you are? Is that who you are? And you are still a believer. You still believe in God. I thought God, your God especially, was a God of perfection because your God is a perfect God. So there's a perfect being theology. Since God is perfect, then you shall be perfect too. And isn't that actually in one of the Gospels? And that is true. So how do we deal with that? That leads me to my second question. Why are we talking about it in two weeks after Easter? I do it prim primarily because there are brothers and sisters who are in the spiritual lurch like this guy right now. Here at Wheaton College, I bet there are. That may be a disappointment for faculty and administration or peer counselors, but to deny that such a silent minority exists is to do injustice to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is much bigger than those who have it together. There are people who are silently crying, and unless we really kind of mind the gap between theology and praxis, unless we recognize that there are sisters and brothers who are really kind of pining away in obscurity and who feel like, ain't nobody giving a dang about me because I'm not the chapel leader. I don't get up on the stage. I don't really get picked by a professor to kind of talk with him or have coffee or lunch. Nobody seems to notice me. There are sisters and brothers like that here in the kingdom of God. And unless we really begin to kind of mind their presence, embrace their frailty, and recognizing that I too am just like you. If the Christian journey means to mind those who are the least among us, then this psalm belongs to the canon. Before we began the chapel today, we were praying, and I shared with the people there as we were praying together that this is one of my favorite psalms. Because I became a Christian at age 21, I grew up a very strong atheist, and when I became a Christian, I had just thought that Christians are perfect people. You have to be blonde hair and blue eyes and have to be six feet tall, and I was none of it. The trifecta of coolness I did not have. <laughs> that Christianity was supposed to be cool. I mean, I, that ain't me, right? Then I came to realize, wait a minute, Jesus' message is radically different. Jesus says, you know, I actually embrace the least among us. And Jesus says, in fact, for the disciples of Jesus, that unless you have what you have done unto the least among us, you have done unto me. There's a radical embodiment of solidarity that Jesus offers, that I am with those who are down and outers. And we need to actually remember that. So I teach a course at this uh, maximum security prison um, this semester. So I tell my son, Christian, I'm going to jail today. I'll be back at, at 8 p.m. I teach from 5 till 7.30 p.m. And it's a course called History of the Odyssey in Christian Traditions. And so there are about 10 insiders, 10 inmates, and about nine Vanderbilt students who come and kind of gather together as a seminar. And one of the stories that we were discussing from the biblical text was, uh, had to do with the silence of God toward the righteous. The story that we had picked for that day in, in our small discussion group was Genesis' story of Cain and Abel. And I was asking the students, so as we have read the story of Cain and Abel in our small group, what do you see there? What kind of picture of God do you see? And a person who is serving life sentence there said, Paul, I see in this story the God of the unrighteous, the God of the losers. And I don't know about, I certainly have heard expressions like that, that's quite Pauline, the God of the unrighteous and so on, but something at that moment really hit me like a ton of brick. This person who is serving life sentence in this maximum security prison nailed it for me, the theological truth that I often kind of that lose my grasp, that God is not just the God of the winners, God is not just the God of the righteous, 
but God is actually the God of the losers. And he proceeded to tell me and the group that I feel like a loser. The society has told me I'm a loser and for sure we're going to lock you up because you're such a loser, we don't want you around. Yet this brother of mine in Jesus Christ has said, you know what? God is the God of the losers. In my drive back home, I realized something that I, I imperceptibly and surreptitiously, I bought this belief that I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. That's perhaps why when this brother said, this is, our God is a God of the losers, it shocked me. It was scandalous initially until the truth began to seep into my soul, nurturing and marinating my soul with the beautiful truth that unless I see myself as a loser, unless I really begin to see myself as someone who's absolutely nothing without the gracious intervention of God, unless we see ourselves as that, then we buy into the lie of triumphalism without the cross of Jesus Christ. That leads me to my last point. Where is God in all of this? Haman says, you have taken from me my friend and neighbor. We so desperately yearn reality to be not like that. Imagine your life with no friends, no neighbor. You're living in a dorm. Nobody talks to you. You had friends a month ago. They're no longer there. Whatever happened, maybe there is a form of shunning that happens even in Christian colleges. As I lived with these undergrads for several years, I came to realize that many of the college students who appear, apparently have it all together are desperately lonely. Haman says, you have taken from me my friend and neighbor, and therefore darkness is my closest friend. One Puritan said that God sees us in all our disasters, darkness, and desolation, and as a result, God takes residence among us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God doesn't wag God's divine and celestial fingers at us. Why don't you try harder, run faster, eat less, exercise more, study harder? God doesn't do that. God sees us in all of our brokenness, all of our frailty and fragility and fallenness, and God says, never mind, I'm going to come and live among you. I'm going to come and experience something that I have not experienced thus far. That is, creaturely frailty that he willingly embraced. And as the ultimate sign of creaturely frailty, Jesus embraced death. We're all aware of Psalm 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the suffering of the cross, God enters into an embodied solidarity with all the sons of Korah, including Haman the Ezraite. In the death of the innocent, God enters into an embodied solidarity with all the daughters of Adam and Eve, including some of us who can honestly say, darkness is my closest friend. Let me make it personal here. Friends, if you can identify with this guy, darkness is my, old, my closest friend, come to God. You may not be able to turn to your friends because you're embarrassed and ashamed. You might feel like, if I tell people that I'm not out of this darkness yet, but we can share, like, yeah, I was in that deep darkness, but I'm no longer there. That's easier to share. But what if you're right in the midst of it, right in the thick of things, you feel totally like nobody and nothing, and what do we do? You don't have to praise God only when things are better. Your groaning is in laments with no hopeful exit sign visible yet. It's okay. It's, it, in fact, it is biblically mandated we have this psalm as a clear testament that God is far bigger than our doubts. God is far brighter than our worst darkness ever. As Martin Luther discovered, the true power of God is displayed only on the cross of Jesus, which stood as an emblem of rejection, loss, and punishment. Yet it is this cross of Christ that proves all of God's saving being and act to be with and for us. Come to this God of the losers, come to this God of the depressed, who has come to light, eternal, and unquenchable joy precisely through the unspeakable sense of dereliction, abandonment, and death. My friends, is darkness your best friend? Come to a better friend who, far, who for our sake embraced darkness, defeated death, and tells you right here and now, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
even when you're sitting on a heap of dung. Come to this, Lord, for he alone is our hope, not only for this Wheaton community, but hope for the world. We do not worship our God who has got everything together, therefore does not need to come down and micromanage. He can just do it from a remote distance. God has come to where we are. And many theologians have pondered that incarnational reality. Why did God have to do that? What is the incarnational imperative? Among other things, I came to realize this, that if God is truly the God of the losers, if God is truly the one who, out of God's wonderful wisdom, saving plan, in that kind of eternal counsel, that God has chosen to be with us, fallen beings, losers, and winners who think they're winners, but in fact are losers. <laughs> and God has chosen to tabernacle among us to show us the way and the truth and the life. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, as we think about the global reality of the church and its witness, calls us to reflect deeply as to what kind of Savior, what kind of Redeemer, what kind of God we are proclaiming. Lord, it is so easy for us to say, my God can be stronger than your God. My God, my God can beat up your God. My God is wealthier and more powerful and more secure than your God. Lord, all of those faulty theologies will not amount to much at all. Lord, as we identify or seek to identify with Haman the Ezraite, the author of this 88th, 88th Psalm, we have come to realize that there still exists that gulf. Even if we were to identify with this psalmist, we somehow have this lingering doubt that will God really embrace me? Will God really accept me? I'm such a horrible mess. And yet you gently come to us in your incarnate self through the power of the Holy Spirit now. We, ask that we invite the Holy Spirit to be among us even at this moment, especially the souls, the souls of those students who feel, or anyone here who is listening or watching, who feel that they're an abject loser, that they don't have it together, that darkness is indeed their best friend. Lord, help us to come to you. May the power of the Holy Spirit who has raised Jesus from the dead work so powerfully and efficaciously among us to accomplish the impossible task right here and right now. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who has embraced darkness itself to give us the light. Amen.